Namo tassa bhagavato arahato summa sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato summa sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato summa sambuddhasa Purang dhammang sangang namasani Welcome everyone to another Wednesday evening Clear Mountain live stream. An issue that I think uh, is important and which I've been hesitant to uh, bring up too early um, or too directly or too publicly just because it hits so close to people's hearts. And that's the issue of euthanasia and uh, also um, legally assisted dying. So uh, what's also known as assisted suicide in some circles and death with dignity in others. And uh, I want to begin with a strong or sincere caveat uh, that most people on this live stream have put down a pet. Um, I know when I was a layman, we put down my dog. Um, many know people who have uh, taken advantage and used assist, uh, legally assisted dying laws and are maybe in the process of that. I have one relative who is currently. And to really say that this uh, talk is not meant to be uh, imply um, judgment uh, on my part personally towards anyone. Rather, I think this is one realm where the Theravada takes a somewhat sharp turn from the liberal consensus as it currently stands. And by, and I think it's important to speak to the Buddhist traditional view and how the Buddha looked at these things and the instructions he gave around them so that when confronted with the situation of a loved one who is going through a painful illness or a pet who is coming to the end of their life, we can make a decision that's informed by also the landmark of the Buddhist lens, the traditional Buddhist lens. So please uh, listen to all this just with um, an understanding of, of compassion behind it, of non-judgment, of an acknowledgement that most people on here have lost uh, a pet, a loved one in these ways. So to begin with, I think it's uh, meaningful to begin by saying that some of this rests on a view of multiple lives and of rebirth. And for those who are still uncomfortable with those concepts or not as interested, um, I'd say that there's a useful analogy I've brought up a few times where Ajahn Jaya Saro says, look, it's like you have a map and you get this map. This is the Buddhist teachings. And the map says there are trees over here and you look and there are trees. And the map says there's a river over here and you look and there's a river. And year after year after year, you find this map is impeccable. It is absolutely accurate. And I think uh, this is the case with the Buddha's teachings for many of us. Over the course of our practice, we find they are correct again and again. And then in the map, you see in the distance, mountains rising uh, high up on the horizon. And you've never seen mountains before. So you're faced with a decision then. Do you automatically dismiss them and say, no, there's no such thing as mountains? Or is there room after a few years or decades of following this map to say, I've never seen mountains before, but I can't actually unequivocally dismiss these. And I have a lot of trust in this map maker after this long. So when confronted with things we don't uh, have experience personally with, phenomena which are outside of our usual realm of understanding, uh, but that the Buddha really speaks about, I think it's useful to take that humility of perspective. And some of this will rest on such humility. So to begin with, the first precept for 
those who have, uh, as many of you know, is the precept against taking life intentionally. And this is founded on this understanding of the sanctity of life in Buddhist thought, that there's something beyond what most of us can see at work, that the taking of a life involves a particular scarring of the heart, which is something most of us can't always intuit or feel, but that is real. That something uh, in us doesn't have the right to take a life. And the place where this comes up uh, or that I wanna speak to it in the context of tonight is first in the concept or the situation of euthanasia for loved pets and animals. And I remember my first dog, his name was Sam, and he was a lovely, big, Great Dane uh, lab mix. And he had terrible arthritis. And after about his 11th or 12th year, we decided it was time to put him down. And uh, we loved that dog. And so we took him to the vet and laid him down and the vet could not find a vein to inject him with or in. And it took uh, 20, 15, 20 minutes for them to find, maybe 15 of us holding him down. It was terrible. Um, that dog did not want to die. And to this day, it still feels like a great betrayal. So when we look to animals that are suffering, um, you know, first, there's this important, I think, acknowledgement that an animal really usually can decide when they're ready to die. Um, animals will stop eating. They will let the body go. However, often it doesn't happen on our own timeline and we're, we're, when we're ready you know, to sort of, when we think they should be, uh, be ready or when their suffering seems to us extreme already. We had a practitioner recently whose dog, um, a blind pit bull, was near death for several weeks and she bore with it for quite a while um, for that entire period and said that the last few days especially, and I, I went over and I chanted for this dog, um, that dog was surrounded by such love in those final weeks. But the last few days, this person said, were just really brutal. The dog um, was in such pain, especially the last night. But she said that only in the last few breaths did she feel like this dog, her companion was truly ready to die and let go. And it did. And there's an acknowledgement that pain is and sickness is often how our attachment to the body softens at the end of life. Uh, there's a scene from War and Peace, I remember, where Prince Alexander um, is in the hospital ward after uh, getting injured in war. And the nurse just watches his eyes take on this long gaze into basically eternity, where slowly the pain lets him release his grip on the world until he's ready to go. And that process can occur with a pet, with an animal. Um, often the pain that we're so eager to save them from is how they prepare to let go of the body. The other thing to acknowledge is in the scope of samsara, with endless rounds of rebirth, where the Buddha says, one who makes their way out of the animal realm into the human realm, it happens as often as, he says, imagine a blind turtle that once every thousand years surfaced and put its head above water in the great ocean. Imagine that there was a small wooden hoop floating on that great ocean about the size of your hand. As often as that turtle surfacing every once, once every thousand years would put their head accidentally through that hoop. That is how often an animal or a being fall into the lower realms finds a human rebirth. 
you think of all the lower realms, the insects, the animals, uh, the realms we can't see, how rare it is to touch a human rebirth. What a precious moment. And you consider that a pet's life is actually quite near that. It's quite adjacent. It's precious. Because in that view of rebirth and samsara, those last few days, weeks of a pet's life, even if they're in pain, if they're surrounded by the love of a human who's practicing even, you know, even better if they're chanting for them, but surrounded by that sort of love is so rare in the scope of samsara, it's precious, even if they're in pain. So just because we're used to seeing them in good health and comfort, the wider vision that the Buddha gave us includes eons, lifetimes of wandering through terrible states of darkness. And the situation of an animal, even in pain, even ill, but surrounded by a human's love, near that proximity of a human rebirth is precious. And we shouldn't be so quick to assume that cutting that short is the right thing to do. The final or another thing is just um, for our own protection of morality, the sense of that scarring of the heart that comes from killing a being and ordering them killed and avoiding that. In terms of sort of absorbing that love, um, I remember reading the account of a psychic, uh, so a medium, which I find interesting sometimes. And who knows if it's true or not? I don't know this person, but they did speak about remembering a past life where they were, they died in the carpet bombings of England when they were about three or four years old as a girl in the subway, or th because the population was hiding in the subways at the time. And she was wondering, why did I have that life? And her reflection looking at it was the love that I absorbed, that I was given in those three or four years was enough to sustain me through the kind of desolation of the next childhood she encountered. So this love can carry beings into the next life, its provisions. If you're with an animal that's dying, if you're surrounding them with care, then maybe you're giving them one of the best gifts they could possibly uh, hope for in that moment, for that time. To acknowledge that uh, if you do do if you do this, um, friends and people will often call you cruel. Um, they'll say, "Why are you being so cruel and keeping your animal alive?" The vet will often uh, really push you to put the animal down. And for those who are interested, I recommend listening to the interview, uh, the second one I did with Bhante Gunaratna. He spoke about their monastery dog who they took to the vet and the vet again and again pushed them to put this animal down because it was near its death. And he said, we said, no, we took it back to the monastery. We got a drip, a syringe of morphine, which we, um, you know, would drop into its mouth in the morning to put the pain out, to get rid of its pain. And we cared for it through the subsequent weeks. And then it decided to die when it was ready. It passed away. And it's very shocking to see an animal really ill. Um, it's, it's hard. I remember in Thailand, I saw where many people keep the first precept very strictly. I went to a house and saw an animal kind of a dog lying in the corner and it was very sick. It would have been put down weeks, maybe months earlier by someone in the US but they were nursing it through that and, and caring for it throughout. So these are reasons why the first precept really um, does apply to euthanasia, to pets. And once again, to circle back and say, this is not said with judgment towards those who have put animals down. Most people here have. Um, it's said with great compassion for that situation where you see a being you love suffering. And it's said with an acknowledgement that there is maybe more than we know going on and that an animal's final days, weeks, months, even in pain with a loving human might be utterly precious. And that often when an animal's ready to go, it will go. And for those of us who have 
put an animal down, to uh, know that often what we can do to address that is to uh, light a candle for them in the morning and the evening near a shrine, maybe with a picture of them or a few of their favorite squeaky toys, dedicate merit, spread loving kindness to them. I lived with a teacher once and he was renowned for certain abilities. And so here's a story for people, whether you not believe in these things, but it's hard to live in. I grew up with a dry materialist worldview. And I have to tell you, it's very hard to live in Thailand in these circles for very long and maintain an unshakable belief that all we know, all we see is what exists. But uh, one day there was a supporter named Yom Nit who came to the monastery and nurse. And this teacher said, Yom Nit, do you, do you own a blind black cat that just passed? And Yom Nit said, uh, no, but yesterday I was driving on the road and I saw the carcass of a blind black cat. Uh, its eyes were crusted over and I felt the surge of metta, compassion. And Ajahn Tong said, actually, I had a vision of it in my meditation last night and it came to me and it said it, it felt your love and it asked for you to dedicate goodness to it, to dedicate merit. So take it or leave it. I don't know the truth of that or not, but, um, but maybe uh, these spirits and these chittas and these hearts can receive goodness after they're gone. And if we have put an animal down, um, trusting that they, you know, to not wallow in remorse around it, that they uh, almost certainly understood the love you had for them. And you can address the issue after through ritual, through spreading goodness, through asking for forgiveness. So the next thing I wanted to touch on is legally assisted dying, uh, phrased with positive valence or negative valence, sorry, as assisted suicide and positive valence in some circles with death with, as death with dignity. And to acknowledge that uh, most Buddhist circles in this day and age tend to lean left. And this is a place where the Theravada takes a sharp turn from the liberal consensus. So to understand that, to understand the triggering that might occur if, as you feel yourself maybe being pushed into a realm of red and blue that you thought you'd be avoiding, and understand that we don't have to wander into that um, explicit framing, but the Buddha spoke about this. And in Buddhism, um, suicide, uh, even towards the end of a life, is against the first precept. There's a, an understanding that one's life, in some sense, is not one's own to take. It's sacred and a gift. And stepping back into that wider view of samsara again, with the blind turtle analogy, with this scope of how long we've been wandering, how rare it is to encounter a positive, a human rebirth, where we know the Dhamma, where we've heard the Dhamma, where we can practice. It's so rare. And every moment of that existence is precious for the sake of practice, even moments in pain, even moments where the body is frail and weakening and rot. In fact, some of those can be the best moments of practice of all. So looking at it that way, you know, this is such a precious human rebirth that there's not really a situation where uh, the scales would weigh such that one would take one's own life. The one exception in the suttas, and this happens two or three times, maybe two, is there's some situations where a monk who is either an arahant or on the maybe on the brink of arahantship, it's not totally clear, uh, is very ill in pain and they take their own life. And always the other monk tries to convince them not to, but then they go to the Buddha and says, you know, this person took their own life. I think Venerable Chana is one of them. And the Buddha says they had attained arahantship at the time of death. Their death was blameless, but that's it. That's the only situation. 
And I'd reference that in most near-death experiences, people who come back, who've come back from a suicide attempt, unequivocally report a sudden feeling and understanding, deep, intuitive, that it was a mistake. I think there's some statistic that people that, I just heard this last week, people who come back from an NDE after a suicide attempt, almost 100% of the time will never attempt suicide again. Absorb that will never attempt suicide again because there's an understanding in that moment of the sanctity of, of their life and of their existence, of the gift it is. So, and to overlay this onto, um, in the Vinaya, um, if, um, well, first to acknowledge there's a separation here between motivation and intention. So the intention to kill is always unwholesome, even one's own life, even one's own life, even an animal. This distinction applies to the euthanasia. The motivation for that intention, whether it be anger, compassion, a desire to not be a burden on your family, a desire to see an animal, a pet, not be in pain. The motivation does not negate the intention of the comma the comma of the intention to kill. They are different. This is displayed very clearly in the Vinaya. Um, as a monk, if I tell someone to, um, you know, if, who's, if someone's in pain and I advise them to let go of life, I don't even have to tell them to take care, take, um, take their own life explicitly. But if I kind of encourage them to, to commit suicide um, because they're in pain. If I advise uh, an executioner to adopt a more compassionate means of executing someone, even though the motivation is compassion because the intention is to kill, to take life, I'm parajika, which means I'm automatically disrobed. This is very clear in the suttas or in the vinaya. Um, intention remains unwholesome if it is to kill, even if the motivation is compassion. Now it's worth noting that in the Abhidhamma, joy is considered a comic intensifier. So if one, you know, with great regret asks a, veterinary, a vet to apply a lethal injection to a beloved pet versus someone who gleefully kills, uh, you know, a mosquito they've, that's been biting them, by that metric, uh, the comma is different. One is softer, but it is still comma. And so just to acknowledge in both of these situations, people will navigate as they will. These are complicated, people live complicated lives. Um, you're navigating by many different views, many different relationships, but this is the traditional Buddhist view. And it's important to have this one to look through as well. The final thing I'd say is that even if one puts aside such uh, wider worldviews or supernatural or un not completely accepted views of rebirth, of samsara, and just looks to the here and now that we can see with our normal senses, um, there's some very interesting articles that have come out recently on the long-term effects of uh, assisted suicide laws in Canada and in the Netherlands as well. So one that I think is really worth reading, if you have a, a subscription to The Atlantic, it's called The Limits of Liberalism. And The Atlantic is a fairly liberal magazine, and it tracks the trajectory of the MAID program in Canada, which is a death with dignity um, or assisted suicide program. And the steady slip of what initially was a uh, allowance for lethal injection just allowed to people truly at the edge of life and how quickly within three or four years, its scope expanded to include people with mental illnesses, including um, at least in the Netherlands, uh, which is another article, um, 
you know, in some cases, depression or severe mental illness like this. And hearing, you know, slippery slope arguments are dangerous because you can justify not establishing a middle path through the slippery slope argument. But these um, investigations into what happens three or four years after such a law is passed are chilling. They, they genuinely are. Um, because one realizes when that sanctity of life is put aside, things get strange real, really fast. And, um, you know, this is uh, the foundation or the view that the Limits of Liberalism article brings up is this distinction between rights-based liberalism, which is the liberalism that says, this is my life, I can do what I want with it. In which case, uh, death with dignity law makes complete sense versus gifts-based liberalism, which is the understanding that our lives are not completely our own. They're gifts to society and gifts from society. And we don't necessarily have the right to take that on our own volition. We belong to people. We belong to people. So to circle back around and just, you know, acknowledge that, um, I know people have navigated these issues. Um, I know that some of, uh, especially probably the euthanasia, uh, part of this conversation is difficult and it's important. And if monks can't speak to it, who can? Um, you know, this is part of our, our duty. So I wanna open things up to questions in the chat. Um, if people have something they'd like to bring up or discuss. And I'm sure some of this will come up on the Zoom after where we'll have a little more time to speak. If questions don't come up, I actually have one of the articles to read to people, um, which we can go into as well. I will speak on, while I'm waiting for any things, questions or other things people wanna to speak to, um, just address the another kind of view I've seen floating around regarding the first precept, which is the idea that, you know, if one eats meat, um, it's better to hunt and kill the animal oneself than to buy it at a grocery store. And on one level, you know, I completely understand why that's a common view. Uh, why would you outsource your own comma if you're choosing to eat meat? What I'd say is the precepts are protective. I reference often the sutta called Thief of Ascent, where a monk is wandering in the woods and picks up a flower and smells it. And a deva comes out of nowhere and says, you know, stop it, don't be a thief of ascent. And the monk says, why are you admonishing me? People do far worse things than this. Why aren't you admonishing, you know, someone who's destroying plant life, who's doing all these other things? And the deva says, wow. Why would I try to clean a soiled diaper? You are a clean cloth. You are a clean cloth. And the monk says, thank you for admonishing me. I understand, I will be restrained. Please warn me in the future if I slip. And then the deva says, what am I, your servant? And the bhikkhu says, sorry, sorry, I'll take care of it myself. But this idea that if one's keeping pure morality, it is so rare and we need to protect that. Um, and to be honest, you know, if you buy meat at a grocery store, I mean, obviously being vegetarian and vegan is, is preferable to all, all these things. And I think that's important. Um, if people can change their eating habits and buying habits of meat, that's very useful and meaningful. Uh, Ajahn Jayasaro is vegetarian, etc. But, in terms of the scarring of the heart, it's important to acknowledge that a worker at a slaughterhouse who's put down a hundred cows that day, you know, the extra cow that your meat consumption would cause him to put down once a year, maybe twice a year, depending on how much meat you're eating, is not going to significantly change that person's karmic track. But you going out and killing 
might very much change the clean cloth of your heart. And one has to hold that truth without conceit, without judgment towards those beings as we all have been who are wandering in difficult situations, sometimes in circumstances they have little control over. Um, but this is, you know, for example, when one buys gas at the pump, um, you know that to some extent you're supporting, um, you know, uh, military involvement in the Middle East. And yet pulling the trigger on the gas pump is not the same as the soldier pulling the trigger in uh, Iraq. And the karma is different. So just to say, you know, when we think the natural state is, you know, humans out there hunting. And then you see a picture of Ajahn Chah standing by a deer and the deer coming up and eating food out of his hand. And you realize that's the natural human state. That's the noble human state. It's a state of complete harmlessness. That's, that's natural. It's not the other. I mean, it's natural. Hunting is natural in the sense of it's what we did for millennia, but it's not the apex of the heart. So we have some questions. Okay. So uh, people did ask if I can read the article. Maybe I will. At the very least, I'll post it in the chat and put it in the description. But let me answer a few of the questions first. How does Buddhism view life support? Do it yourself motorcycling. <laughs> good name. This is actually a really good question. Um, you are not required to continue life through artificial means. You are not required to continue life through artificial means. Um, if someone's on life support, the decision to unplug them is more complicated. Um, and I don't feel comfortable getting into it as a monk right now, um, just because if I say the wrong thing, um, it could uh, be a serious offense. But I will say that if someone is not on life support, it's not necessary um, and they're dying naturally, you were not making the first precept by letting them die naturally. I think that's a very relevant thing to think about um, in terms of do not resuscitate orders and making sure that, um, you know, so many people these days die in an emergency room being shocked and, you know, trying to prolong life at all cost. And there's something to be said for letting death take its natural course. Venerable, I rejoice, approve, praise, and encourage you to continue abstaining from the destruction of life. Could you talk briefly why this is, as the Buddha says, deposits one in a heavenly state here and now? The precepts are interesting. Sometimes they seem fairly, um, you know, maybe we're, we don't kill animals or uh, insects often. Maybe it's just every now and again. So we think we're actually pretty close to holding the first precept. Maybe we just go fishing every now and again. But it's, we don't know what we don't know. The beauty of heart and the breadth of heart that occurs and arises once the precepts are kept is take some time and yet it's profound when after two years of not killing you realize like something in you that says i will not kill there's something that glows in the heart that responds to that it leaps up it rejoices at that as the Buddha said, one becomes sensitive to the pleasure of being blameless. So that's the heavenly state. It's a refined joy and it takes a while to get the feel for. But often we don't realize the subtle violence and cutting off we're doing to our heart when we break precepts on a even semi-habitual level. We don't know what our hearts would look like if we were holding these precepts purely. So that's the heavenly rebirth. But some of us have only be begun to touch heaven. So it's hard to know what it would be like to touch until we've kept it for a time. But as I said many times, you know, 
we realize in the West that internal inclination affects external action. We feel compassion for a pet or an animal so we don't kill it. What we've forgotten is that an embodied action affects the heart. The road runs both ways. And that if you don't kill for two or three years, if you resist the impulse to slap the mosquito every time it lands, over time your heart changes. And you start to think like the spider in your bathroom is kind of cute. Um, it's, it's great. Uh, you start to really, the world opens up. So that's heavenly. Ajahn, speaking of the first precept, what is your perspective on how to handle pests, especially more troublesome ones like fleas, bed bugs, ticks, etc.? I have killed many of these in my life, unfortunately. That's a hard one. Um, I would say doing everything one can to try and prevent um, those issues from arising. Um, I'd say there's some new treatment methods for mice. Um, there's a, a guy in Bainbridge now who um, puts in the food of mice a thing that sterilizes them. So it doesn't kill them, but it keeps them from reproducing. And within one generation, the mice, mouse infestation is, is finished. So there's that. Um, cinnamon is great in repelling ants, tracking down the place where they're coming into the house and filling that up. Um, and beyond that, I have to say as a monastic, I, I need to just stop uh, speaking. People sometimes will choose to take on that karma um, if say termites inv invade their house, but I'm, uh, I, I feel like I don't wanna wander into that, that realm at the moment. Do you have any thoughts on the use of pain medication at the end of life since that pain, the pain that occurs can be part of the practice? Oh, and I will say about the pests, um, if one does do take a life um, in any sense, euthanasia, uh, pests, et cetera, really spreading merit, dedicating merit, remembering those beings who have passed. Okay, do you have any thoughts on the use of pain medication at the end of life since the pain that occurs can be part of the practice? I think pain medication is, is just fine. Um, you know, uh, if one personally wants to work with the pain and feels like it's actually really useful, then, you know, and is able to kind of work with it, then that's great. Um, but, you know, often the pain will really be, um, you know, a distraction and scatter one's mindfulness. Many of us don't have the concentration to maintain clear centered awareness through uh, the end of a life uh, through serious illness and without any sort of pain medication. So it's fine to use. Um, and that process of letting go will often occur. Something's happening at a deeper level. Pain is part of it, but you know, often one will let go towards the beyond um, regard, you know, even without being in acute pain, it's okay especially for an animal or something. So really good question. And yeah, I think making death comfortable, surrounding the person with love, holding their hand, doing the same for a pet, playing chance for them. Um, this stuff sinks in, even if you think the animal doesn't understand. Um, there's karma there and end of life lucidity is interesting. Even if you think the being is gone, you know, there are all these stories of suddenly at the end of a life, someone suddenly gazing out through eyes that have been clouded with dementia, with pain, with Alzheimer's, and they're there again. And they'll address everyone in the room and die. It's, it's such a common uh, occurrence. So even if they seem like they're not there, treat them like they are. And uh, touch towards the end of a life, uh, often really holding someone's hand, being there for them in that way. It's a good death there. And what is the karma of a person that has to approve euthanasia for a relative in a coma who, while in her senses, requested for that under certain circumstances? Oh, man. So I'd say that if a relative had 
express it, expressly written out a contract of intent to be followed by a doctor. That's between them and the doctor. And um, one is not morally obligated to get in the way of that. As to if it has to move through one and one has to put their signature on it, etc. That's something I, I once again need to step away from speaking to directly. Just so people know, in the monastic rule, if, if I give approval or encourage something that could be seen as taking a life and one of you does it, then uh, like a human life, I am, I am paragic, even if it happens 20 years after this talk, um, even if it's in something that seems a little more of a gray area, um, which means that I'm automatically disrobed. So you'll see me going up to any of these kind of gray areas, which is obviously where a lot of the questions exist. And just saying, I can't actually wander in there. It's too dangerous for me. Um, I'm sorry. And I don't have sort of the deeper knowledge of these things that some of my teachers might um, with abilities beyond what I have. So I'm sorry, I can only wander so far up to that boundary of the gray. I know in Tibetan Buddhism, there's a lot of emphasis on human life is precious. I don't hear this so overtly in the Theravada. Would you speak to that? Oh, it's everywhere in the Theravada, everywhere, everywhere. No, the Buddha, um, and, and not to say you're right, like it's, it's emphasized, I hear it emphasized more in the Tibetan in common teachings, but just to say that in the suttas, the Buddha really does speak to it. Um, and the suttas where he does, you know, he'll make that analogy of, uh, he'll give that analogy of the turtle, the blind turtle surfacing. He'll also, um, often say there are one of my favorites and i think i've mentioned this before is the 10 unfortunate circumstances and he says the first unfortunate circumstance is a tathagata a fully enlightened buddha has arisen in the world but one is born in the lower realms and does not hear their teaching this is the first unfortunate circumstance the second a tathagata arises in the world one is born a human but one is born in the realms of uh, the barbarians. So uh, where there is no teaching. So this would, you know, these are not popular terms for good reason these days. Um, the point being there that one is born in a place where the Dhamma is not taught or available. Um, not that all such places are barbarous, just that's what he's referencing. So one does not hear the Dhamma and cannot practice. This is the second unfortunate circumstance. The third, one is born human, a Tathagata has arisen in the world. One is born human. One is born in the uh, interior where the Buddhist teaching is taught, but one is not uh, intelligent enough to understand it. This is the third unfortunate circumstance and so on until it comes to, this is the ninth unfortunate circumstance. A Tathagata has arisen in the world. One is born human. One is born in the interior lands. One is intelligent enough to understand the Dhamma. One uh, hears the Dhamma. One practices the Dhamma. Sorry, this is the final fortunate circumstance. The one preceding that, which I was referencing, is all the other things are correct. One is born human in the interior. One is intelligent, but a Tathagata has not arisen in the world. So the Buddha is saying, of all these circumstances, we've landed at this convergence of hearing the Dhamma, being born human at a time when this teaching is extant. How rare. Use this well. Do not take it for granted. You may never get another chance. So it's important. There's this double vision where one has to hold that truth. This is precious. And you don't want to hold that truth such that it makes you terrified. Just as rebirth can be used to kind of invoke this real circumspection and understanding the preciousness of this rebirth. Also, we can remember that um, if we don't attain our hauntship, this life, it's not the end of the picture. You know, if we're cultivating these ties with the Buddhist path, if we're practicing that kama is provisions for the next life and it is powerful kama, we're creating bonds with beautiful Kali and Amitta, and those relations can travel too. So I hope that answered some of it. 
Okay. So I so appreciate everyone um, being willing to kind of listen through all this and uh, navigate this with, with me. Um, I'll post the link to some of the articles I've referenced in the uh, description to this video after things have wrapped up. But for now, we can join each other for a more intimate discussion on Zoom, as we always do from 6.45 to 7.30 Pacific time. I posted the link in the chat. And for those of you who can't see it for whatever reason, go to clearmountainmonastery.org and you will find uh, the link under the Wednesday evening live stream listing, uh, listing. So take care, all of you. Be well.